Ah, geek out. Hey, welcome to another installment of Catching Up. I'm Sam. I'm Chris. I'm <laughs> and this week we have another interview for you. This is with Christian Canamessa, Chris Passetto, and Lucas Kettner. They're here to talk about their, uh, really, their comic writing debut. Uh, Christian is one of the writers on Red Dead Redemption. Him and Chris both wrote uh, Air, starring, um, what's his name, Norman Reedus, uh, you know, which we, you know, we got to go to the premiere party at San Diego. Oh, yeah. Yeah, over in uh, Petco Park. Nice little cemetery there. But Ooh. they're here to talk about their Image comic series, uh, Kill the Minotaur, also through Skybound. So, yeah, let's let them talk about it. And joining us this week, we have Christian Cantamessa, Chris Passetto, and Lucas Kettner. Their, uh, their book, uh, Kill the Minotaur, comes out via Image and Skybound in comic book stores everywhere and on Comixology on Wednesday, June 14th. Gentlemen, thanks for coming on the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. So let's knock the big question out of the way first. So Christian, Chris, how do you guys go from writing a sci-fi action film to writing a swords and sandals epic following the adventures of Theseus against the titular Minotaur? Um, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, well, how did we even do it? Um, well, I think, first of all, it was like, like, it's, like you make it sound. It, it was a little bit of a uh, of reaction from us after writing Air, which I believe is the movie you were referring there, mm-hmm. um, which actually is uh, a lot more of a claustrophobic thriller with a little bit of action uh, than, a, than a big action uh, film. But still, it's not as uh, swords and sandals, uh, horrific epic like uh, kill the minotaur so um yeah i guess and chris feel free to uh jump in uh with your with your take my, my take is that at least for me it was a bit of uh for reaction uh we worked on air for several years to get the script into a presentable producible shape um and that was our first script our first movie script together and we started working on the idea of a story uh, with Theseus and the Minotaur and, and our own take on it uh, right after that movie and way before it got made. And kind of we, we didn't even know what type of story, what type of medium we would use to tell the story, if it was going to be a movie or a comic or, um, you know, a video game, I don't even know. We just had that <laughs> idea that we, can, we were bouncing around. And I even seem to remember that Chris wanted to do a story about the Minotaur for quite some time. So we were kind of uh, in that space of like, okay, we've done the two guys in a basement. What do we do next? It's maybe a little, a little bigger. Um, and uh, we came up with that. Yeah, part of it also is like, like I mean, <clears throat> come from video games too. Like we're, we're big fans of genre stories, right? So, you know, Era had... Uh, a sci- sci-fi leanings, but uh, you know it's not strictly you know a hard sci-fi story, and and we're both fans of you, know, of you know things like westerns. We both worked on Red Dead Redemption and video games and 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 fantasy, and we we kind of talked a lot about like, well, if the way we work, how would we do something that was fantasy? in the fantasy genre. And, and I think we're both a lot more grounded than, than traditional high fantasy stuff. Um, and then we also talked about horror and, and, and we're, we were batting around a whole bunch of different ideas there. Um, and kill the Minotaur, I, I guess, like Christian said, kind of grew out of like, let's do something similar, but different. And let's talk about like, you know, a more pure horror piece. Um, and, and, and how would we, how would we tackle fantasy? And, and that's, that's kind of where we, you know, we started talking about Greek myth and and how we could tell a cool story that was horror and and, and had a little bit of fan- fantasy leanings, but but it actually shares some similarities with stuff that we did in Air, where there's a lot of focus on characters and a lot of focus on like groups under stress. Um, so I guess I guess that's kind of a lot of a lot of elements that came together to make this happen. And when you think about it, it is. Um, a fairly claustrophobic story of a bunch of people trapped in a in an environment with something horrible happening to them. So uh, you know, air 
uh, was a low budget indie sci-fi thriller and and kill the minotaur is a comic book it's a h horrific comic book with uh mythological underpinnings but they share some kind of uh common dna in that both stories are about confinement and uh you know pr the primal fear of being hunted and trapped yeah which is like the cornerstone of like so many slasher just horror movies in general just getting picked off one by one in an enclosed area Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Now, Lucas, how how do you enter the uh, the uh, kill the Minotaur uh, picture? Well, um, let me see. Uh, right around the time that uh, I had a couple other projects ending, um, uh, our our editor uh, Sean Makowitz, uh basically just just shared a uh, a look and feel document with me. It was just a PDF about just like, hey, here's a, you know, here's kind of like the direction we'd like to go in, and you know, it had a few of the characters, it had a brief synopsis and a few of the characters called out, um, and uh, you know, a lot of those look and feel PDFs and stuff are, are you know, found images, examples of like, not actors that that the characters would need to look like, but sort of like the, the sort of presence they would have on the page and stuff. And so as soon as I saw that look and feel PDF, uh, I was just kind of hooked. Um, Thessius and the Minotaur was always like one of my favorite myths as a kid. I, I was really into Greek mythology. Uh, and um, when I saw that, it, 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 it just it really seemed like a fit. And so I uh, basically just told him, yeah, you know, I'd, I'd like to... Uh, just let me in on the script phase, <laughs> you know, w w once you guys have finished scripts and stuff, but for now, yeah, I'll, I'll keep, you know, I'll keep my schedule open. This seems great. And it's, and, uh, uh, a little while later we were, we just kind of jumped right into it and started designing things and, uh, fleshing out, uh, the way the, the world would look. And, uh, uh, yeah. And it, it was, it was great. Yeah. Well, you raise a good, you know, you raise a good point. Like, what is it about Theseus in the in the in the Minotaur? I mean, Greek mythology, Greco-Roman mythology is some of the richest, most well-known mythology in the entire world. You know, it's lasted millennia. What is it about this specific story? Again, you know, Theseus and the Minotaur that that stands out among all of that. I, I think part of it is just that it, for me, it's it is one of the more grounded myths. It's. Uh, it's very linear. It doesn't have a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot less of like, uh, very ostensibly like God's interfering and, um, you know, uh, the, the, the weird magical things are, are almost kept a little bit, uh, a little bit less in Theseus and the Minotaur. And it was always the one as a kid that I always wondered, well, why aren't there more movies about this? I mean, like it's touched on in things like, uh, you know, just very vaguely in things like Jason and the Argonauts and Clash of the Titans and, and some of the Harryhausen stuff. Um, and, you know, it gets like, it gets kind of a quick shout out in like the newer stuff, like Immortals and stuff like that. But I always wondered why wasn't there some kind of like really interesting uh and fresh kind of retelling of it and so when i realized that's what they were doing i just i, I really wanted in i think also like we we jumped on it like like if i can speak also about the the myth like it, it's a really great like you said it it has common elements to you know the the killer in the house stalking you through you know room to room and you think about that that primal fear of it and that, that was a that was a big part of what we wanted to capture but then if you look back at the myth, there were all these other like weird little character things, you know, the the sacrifices, the boat that shows up and says, yep, give us give us your your best youths and, and we're going to sacrifice them. And so that was an interesting thing for us to touch on. And then there was the the whole parentage of the Minotaur where you read it in some some mythology text and it's like. Yeah, the the king's wife laid with a bull and you know made a half you know half bull half man and and they they wanted to keep it so they made this maze and you're you're kind of reading this in in the mythology context it, they just kind of like step through it like yep half man half bull put it in a maze <laughs> feed it feed it people and and 
like if you start thinking about that in terms of a story and, and our approach, like putting real people in that situation, they're looking at each other like, what's going on here? Like, like, really? Is, is this is this really what's happening around us? Is this really what we're being asked to, to do? And, and I think that there were so many other, like Lucas said, not like God's intervening and, and just doing things for godly reasons, but but people doing these things that that made them interesting characters. And I, I think we, we tried to capitalize the, on that in the comic to, to show these characters and why they're making these these choices that are rooted in myth, but but played out through our story. And then, Kristen, do you have anything to kind of add on to the appeal of, of Theseus in the, in the Minotaur? Well, what, what I'll add is that I, uh, well, obviously I, I love uh, everything that my two esteemed colleagues have just said, and I wholeheartedly agree. And I also um, love the idea that we're doing a little bit of, um, of an origin story as well in this comic. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you shouldn't necessarily, you know, approach it and read it as the origin story, but there w- there is an element of it. And it, it was really fascinating to kind of go and, and, and try to strip away some of the, some of the myth and go, okay, where does this come from? And what could have originated this uh, man bull thing uh, in this, in this labyrinth? And um, how do you, you know, how do you become the hero of the songs? If you're just a real person like uh, like Theseus, or at least our version of Theseus, so it was a lot of fun to also approach it with like, uh, shall we say, a little bit of a postmodern um, attitude to 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 the myth. I will say, you know, Ariadne has her own kind of theological underpinnings. You know, she's I believe she marries like Dionysus or or something within mythology and all that. Uh, are we going to, you guys kind of hinted that we wouldn't, but are we going to see some of those gods come into play in Kill the Minotaur? <laughs> uh, um, Without so, spoiling too much. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we don't want to spoil it. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's uh, like Christian said, it's, it's a lot of, a lot of what we're doing is about how, you know, things happened in our story which could you know you could easily look at them and say oh like in an oral tradition hundreds or thousands of years later it would be interpreted as this or that and and we we tried to create these like it's 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 an origin of of a myth like specifically of 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 a, a story that's been told and retold and twisted and and you know gods have been inserted so so you know specifically you know God figures showing up in in the classical sense. I I think it's it's us more about telling telling our story, and I think there's going to be a lot of hints that that you'll see, like oh, like this is kind of like the what happened, you know, possibly our version of what happened that would have been reinterpreted by the classical mind to to you know attrib- to be attributed to gods and and other forces. Good job, Chris. Um, yeah, my sorry. Jedi, Jedi <laughs> mind tricking your way out to that question. <laughs> nice read. I have nothing to add. <laughs> I couldn't do a better job at confusing everyone. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Chris. Well, it's it's a team effort. It's a team effort. Um, so uh, we see at the at least certainly in this first issue, there is a lot of reluctance coming from come a lot of inner turmoil, a lot of inner conflict, a lot of reluctance that we see in um, in Theseus. We see that in the main characters of Air. We see that in John Marston in uh, in uh, Red Dead Redemption. What is it about writing those types of characters that you find so appealing? Well, you guys have done a comparative media study of uh, <laughs> all, all the work that we've done. The works um, of Canta Mesa. Um, so... Well, well, I, I will answer. I'll answer my take, and then again, Chris can can go with his own. I personally am very attractive. Attracted. I'm very attractive, and I'm also very <laughs> attracted to stories, um, to to post-apocalyptic stories, and I mean that in the very sort of uh, lateral sense. Uh, attracted to stories about the end of one's world and the beginning of another. Uh, and putting character in that in that particular position where everything that they know has either gone away or is going away, 
and uh, they're faced with the new and they're either paralyzed or take the plunge or uh, their past comes back to haunt them. And, and obviously you can see that because of your comparisons there, you can see that in Red Dead Redemption with the story of John, John Marston. You can see that in, in, um, in Air with the story of uh, these, these two guys and the world is literally ended for them, but they're carrying on their hopes, everyone's hope for the future. Um, and they're living in this sort of like paralyzed netherworld. Um, you can see it in Manant, another game that I wrote, uh, where the character at the beginning, James Earl Cash, literally dies and is reborn in this hideous, I mean, is, is not literally killed, his, his death is simulated uh, so that these horrible people can kill him for real in this blood sport. Um, so, and, and, and probably you can see it in the first episode of, uh, and in, in fact, the whole thing of Kill the Minotaur, where you have a, a character who is, um, who's very reluctant to, um, abandon his own life, um, eventually completely reshapes his world and the world of everyone. Chris? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, well, it's it's funny because I think I thought was what was one of the interesting things, you know, like there's a the, there's a classic hero pattern of, of the the heroes reluctant to go on the journey. Um, but one of the interesting things about Theseus and this is, again, like looking at how myths are written, you know, Theseus decided to go and solve the problem by killing the Minotaur. And, and it just sort of happens. Um, so we wanted to have this reluctance but i think for our character it's also balanced against like he he actually wants to be a hero a lot of a lot of those other characters are you know shying away from the spotlight but thesis wants the spotlight he just has absolutely no idea what he's getting into because he's young and reckless which is part of how he how he starts um the journey that he needs to take um and it's it's a lot of what we wanted for this retelling of the Minotaur story that are that Theseus and and the other characters are kind of aware of myths in general. That that Theseus is like I I kind of want to be a Hercules. I want statues made of me. Um, and that's you know he's reluctant, but at the same time when the opportunity shows up, he he jumps on it maybe a little too eagerly. Um, so, so it was interesting, like having that tension between his, his, his youth and petulance and 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 his, you know, brashness and the traditional hero reluctance. So at the at the emotional core of of Kill the Minotaur, it's really Theseus is both kind of a, a coming of age story and a, and a classic hero's journey. Oh yeah, yeah, I would I would definitely say so. Like like. Um, I guess, you know, kind of learning as he's on this hero's journey, he's learning that it's there's a lot more involved than what he might imagine from from a song or a story or the myths that 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 he kind of fancies himself as being the the protagonist of like like a, a Hercules kind of like, oh, I, I would love to be I would love to be that hero. But um, it's not it's not that easy and it's our story certainly isn't that straightforward. I love the coming of age um, genre insertion there. And I think it's very applicable for the story. Um, and, and certainly not even just for, not even just for the, for the hero, but I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's a lot of parental stuff. Um, it, but even that's that's part of the myth. Um, you had Theseus and 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 his father, um, who who his father made this deal with Crete, and Crete had King Minos, and Ariadne is the daughter of King King Minos. And so there's a lot of parental stuff um, that that's woven into our story, and 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 how those and children kind of have to have to deal with the the world that's been created by their parents. And the minus and King Minus sees the Minotaur as his own son. He just yes. he's just trying to nurture his his boy with the seven best from Athens every so often. 
Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and with, again, with, which was part of the myth, like how how he had this this half half son and and decided, well, I I can't keep <laughs> I can't keep my my bull boy in the palace with everyone else. So I guess I guess we'll build a maze for him. I, I don't know. It, it's one of those things that, again, when you read it in the myth, you're like, what's what's actually going on here? And that, that was part of some of the stuff that was fascinating and, and where we. We we took those those weird snags um, in the story and and we just kind of teased them out to make our own, what I what I feel like was our own twist on the on the narrative. I, I do have to say, Lucas, looking at you know having read the first issue, there is a certain figure that is wearing a gold bull helmet, and it is one of the most badass introductions I've seen in comics so far this year. <laughs> So well done. How do you kind of balance the? Oh, uh, <laughs> how do you balance the uh, historical with the uh, with the more horrific elements and supernatural elements that are kind of brewing and will you know develop as the story progresses? Oh, I think it's. Um, uh, I mean, there was there was a there was a good clutch of of uh, design work that happened before then. Um, mainly because I had to like refamiliarize myself with even just like how things uh, uh, are reported to look back then. And I say are reported to look because, I mean, there is there are, like, a lot of gaps that have just kind of been speculated or assumed, especially when it comes to uh, uh, the Minoan civilization. Um, and I really, I really wanted to take those two cultures and just visual do like a visual shorthand for the both of them so that it was really you know kind of subtly clear that one one was the dominator and the other one was you know the 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 athenians athens has has lost the war they're you know they're uh they're a little bit more subdued pacifistic you know they're uh you know, you see Athens, and there's a lot, a lot of busted statues around. They don't have a lot of money right now, <laughs> you know. And um, and when really uh, uh, marrying that stuff with more of the fantastical side that uh, that does come up a little bit later, uh, I think it meshes really well. And there's story reasons for why it meshes really well, which I really like. And so that stuff was. You know that was always really, really directed to, to, to uh, design and design around and stuff like that. And uh, I think because of that, like we, even from the very beginning, um, you know, it only took one or two rounds of design stuff for everyone to get on the same page and be like, oh yeah, but just a little more like this and then a little more like that. And it, it there was, it was only like the the early points where like I. I think I jumped the gun by a few weeks and even started just drawing stuff before I'd signed a contract just because I was just, <laughs> I, I really liked it that much. And I was just like, oh, what if, what if this guy looks like this and this guy looks like that? And, you know, and uh, luckily all that caught up and like it just became part of the process. But it, it was, um, yeah, it, it was a process for me just because uh, I hadn't thought about a lot of this stuff since, since I was younger. And I used to, to really, uh, engross myself in a lot of the the Greek myths and the the ancient cultures of the time, and uh, and then to try to find this sort of uh, this X factor that that drives the uh, that that is a plot point in the story. That was you know it was it was really fun, and once we finally found the balance for that, it was uh, it, I think it I think it made for some cool imagery. And this is, I mean, I, I think as history students or, you know, people that just casually know Athens, we always hear that it's like the intellectual capital of, like, ancient Greece. We never really, even though Athens was, you know, conquered by Crete, conquered by, I think at one point Sparta, at one point Thebes, at one point Persia, we never see Athens depicted as the underdog. So this is kind of an Athens that I feel like the general public isn't overly familiar with. I hope so, Yeah. Yeah, I, I, like, I mean, anyone who's thinking back to their, their, any sort of uh, uh, education they've had in classical Greek culture, 
Yeah, I mean, what do you think of it? You think of all the Renaissance paintings where everyone's sitting around reading scrolls and, like, debating stuff, but w- what you never see is is that uh, at many points in history, these guys were... Uh, civilization barely survived, you know? So it's it's kind of it's kind of nice to play with that a little bit, especially in the context of the myth where it's really appropriate. Yeah, and I think I think one of the other things that that Lucas also captured really well was like, you know, the, those those paintings that you see of these like these elevated scholars with golden light bathing their their <laughs> head and shoulders, like like there there were other people. <laughs> it wasn't a city made up of, of of only like these you know intellectual scholars like trying to comprehend the 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 meaning of of the universe like there were there were regular people in who lived in homes that weren't necessarily like these grand temples like like again we we always think of athens we think of the 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 parthenon and the the huge marble columns but there were other people and 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 those were the people that actually were the more interesting characters for us to to touch on and they lived in regular homes and they had regular feelings and thoughts that we can relate to really well today. Um, and they were, and they were flawed. So I, I think, I think capturing that, you know, not the classical idyllic version of Greek culture, um, was part of, uh, our story and, and, and again, Lucas did a did a great job of like, kind of like making these different characters and different postures and 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 representing not just one viewpoint of the classical Greek scholar, but a but a multitude of viewpoints in that society. Well, I had great stuff to work with, so but thank you. <laughs> nice. Um, again, team effort, team effort. So team effort. What can we expect moving forward for, you know, those that aren't overly familiar with the, uh, with the myth? What can we expect beyond the first issue? Oh, it's going to get weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know how much uh, more. There's, lot, there's lots of cool twists. Um, you know, I don't think you need to be familiar with the myth to be able to appreciate them. Mm-hmm. But... Um, there's lots of cool twists and someone might see something on the page and say, Oh, they took that and, you know, translated it into this, this other thing. That's, that's kind of neat, but I don't think that's, that's necessary. Um, I think the, the first issue sets the table. Um, and then after that, the, the twists come pretty heavy and the, and the weirdness yeah, <laughs> I can't There's get also specific. a lot of blood and a lot of killing and mayhem, yeah. and death and that sort of stuff. Yeah, I mean, like we we certainly go a lot more into the horror stuff, and and thanks to you know again, I'll I'll pat Lucas on the back. Thanks to Lucas, I, I think he he really delivers the the visuals of the the weirdness and the horror and and the you know the the atmosphere that's that's kind of terrifying um and and so the first issue kind of like like presents our people as like hey the ancient greeks weren't very different from us they they're they're just kind of like regular people that includes theseus um and then when things get really weird and horrific uh, you know beyond the first issue i i think you know the reader will feel that that it's not some you know, some square jawed hero who's just kind of striding into the into the horror w- without any without any fear. I, I think the first issue s- sets that up so that when things pick up and, and get really nutty and, and and terrifying that you you realize that these people are about as equipped for it as we might be. Well, something I do find, you know, fascinating about the first issue is even from Jump Street it's very clear that Theseus isn't like, isn't Hercules. He isn't, you know, Achilles. He isn't this perfect, unstoppable hero. He makes mistakes. He makes, and he pays for them. And, uh, I, you know, I think that's a, a good, he's, he's displayed as competent, but not, but not confident. If that, if that makes any sense, he's not, he's not running the show. Oh yeah. Theseus is the last person on earth that's running that show. 
<laughs> uh, he, he thinks he's running the show, but everybody else is running it for him. Right. Yeah. So I can only presume, you know, it'll be, we got jaw-dropping visuals ahead when we see the true extent of the labyrinth, when we actually get the uh, the Minotaur reveal and that sort of thing. I, I, I mean, you guys certainly tease at it with this first one, but I'm guessing stuff escalates rather quickly, rather, you know, start as soon as issue two drops. Well, you do get a shot of the exterior of the labyrinth in the in the first issue, so you can kind of already see the extent of the madness, um, even in the first issue. But I think it's from the second issue when you when you're actually inside the thing that the things uh, become interesting uh, from that sort of horrific perspective. But um, you know, it's not like we're laying a lot of pipe in, in the story. The story comes uh, comes pretty easy uh, because the telling is so pri- primal and archetypal. So even just in the first issue, we, we can do some really interesting... Uh, we, we can have a, a few interesting moments for the, for the characters, which if are as important as the, you know, the mayhem and the gore that they'll come later. It's not more important. <laughs> I say that, but I just want to get a lot of mayhem and killing. <laughs> <laughs> just get straight to the action, sure. Now, something that we ask everybody that comes on the show, what are you gentlemen currently geeking out over? Oh, gosh. I, I, uh, <laughs> I, Christian's, Christian's going to laugh at me, but I, I'm, I'm geeking out over his next the project that the uh shadow of war stuff that's the trailers have shown up i think uh this week christian uh yeah i mean there's these trailers uh, coming out every other week apparently but yeah yeah there's... so i'm i'm excited and 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 thank you yeah <laughs> yeah i'm excited for uh for that stuff paid promotion for yeah for So that's me. Yeah. <laughs> you guys currently enjoying anything? Vibing on anything? Oh, I. Uh, I always get to things uh, almost a long time after everyone else does. So uh, you know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of, uh, I'm taking in the first season of Man in the High Castle right now. Uh, I'm loving. Uh, uh, my studio mate Steve Steve Lieber does a book with Nick Spencer called The Fix, um, which is just you know really good. Uh, God, there's I'm always geeking out on so much that there's too many to count. Uh, I I always get the new Gorillas album because they're cartoon <laughs> characters, sure. and I love cartoon <laughs> characters. <laughs> Have you been digging the uh, the new Samurai Jack? Yes. Oh, good call. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm only about four or five episodes in. I've been kind of saving them up. But, uh, to be yeah, fair, they're really, only really seven fun episodes stuff. Deep. Yeah. The, uh, the first episode alone, I think, is like almost like a master class in color theory, you know? Uh huh. Yeah, and in just like, you know, how, how far out can you draw something like timing? And still have it be just completely engrossing, you know. He was always good at that. Yeah. Christian, you currently uh, geeking out over anything? Uh, probably like far too many things to really have time for. Um, you know, I should really be writing and working. Um, but uh, yeah, sure. Um, I've I've been playing. Uh, the new uh, Resident Evil, Resident Evil 7, and kind of trying it with a bit of VR, a little not VR, it's too scary in VR, stop killing me. Um, so, you know, I love horror uh, and horror in games and in movies, and so that that game, um, to me, has done, like, a fantastic job, at least so far I'm, I'm about halfway through in terms of, like, really pushing the envelope and doing something different, but also really feeling like Crescent Evil. Um, and um, so 
I have a I have a stack of other video games that I have to play, but um, that that's the one that that I've kind of been geeking on and playing and obsessing over uh, because it's so scary. Um, I've been watching a TV show called The Ants Made Tale. Um, oh, yeah. I thought I didn't think uh, much of it starting, and uh, it's it's crazy. It's amazing and crazy, and I'm like, what am, why am I watching it and liking it? I, I think it's uh, such a dystopian, uh, it's not even sci-fi. I don't even, it's, it's almost like a clockwork orange level of sci-fi or 1984. It's a, dyst- it's a proper dystopian political societal story um, that really gets you at, at a, you know, it gets under my skin for many of the, the themes that they're dealing and I, I, I just recommend I think there's like a few episodes out and I really recommend people check it out for themselves but it might, admittedly it might not be everyone's cup of tea um, yeah I, a lot of a lot of other stuff um, that, I'm, that I'm doing right now that it, I might not even be able to discuss, but um. <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> well, you guys invoked horror quite a bit, and as you guys pointed out, horror isn't really something that most people associate with, with you know, classic mythology. Even though, like, horrific horror. I mean, how many ta- how many Greek heroes literally go to hell? If you think about it, um, you know, across the river Styx and all that. So there were. Th- I think that's always been there. I remember, you know, Clash of the Titans scaring the hell out of me as a kid. But the um, what what is it about horror that that you guys particularly enjoy, just you know as an abstract? Um, well, I I can go first, guys. If you if you guys sure. want, but just sure. just so if I get the question right, is what what do what do I enjoy in horror in general, mm-hmm. or in 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 consuming it as well as writing it and. I guess in general, I, I, I think it's a very sort of primal form of um, connecting with the material. I think that um, together with comedy, the ability of scaring people and making people laugh are like two immediately connectable um, emotions that, that go to like the basics um, and, you know, ostensibly making people cry, but but that's um, that's on a different level. I think that, um, especially when you look at some of the more um, audacious horror movies out there, like The Shining, for example, they're like a great treatment of um, who we are as people, and uh, and then they can also be consumed on a on a more superficial level as. Um, that movie scared the shit out of me. It's a great roller coaster. So I kind of love the, I, I love the the ability to kind of uh, have have an accessible film or story or book um, that also indulges me on a on on an intellectual level and and keeps me engaged and entertained on a on a physical level. Um, you know, you watch something like Psycho, The Babadook, The Shining. You read Stephen King, you know, read it, it from Stephen King, and and there's always two two layers at play. They play you like a violin. There is the there is the uh, uh, roller coaster emotional physical reaction to things, and then there's the intellectual um, stimulation of actually getting a read over the material that that is that is meaningful for the human condition. Chris, Lucas, Luke. do you want to? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean that pretty much covers everything that I that I love about horror as well. Um, the reason that uh, that I got interested in drawing horror was uh, I've always liked horror, even as a kid and stuff like that. But I don't think I really grew to love it until. I realized that all the artists that I wanted to to uh, emulate or draw from or learn from were horror artists. They were it was uh, uh, P. 
people like um, you know Bernie Wrightson and uh, uh, Mark Schultz. Uh, arguably, the the Cadillacs and dinosaurs stuff could be could be horror here and there, even though it's it's more of like a, a, a code. Drama. But um, and there's a and there's a lot more that I can't I uh, just aren't coming to mind right now. But uh, so when I realized that like that was kind of the way I wanted to draw, especially after like using a brush and ink for the first time and getting all those nice little hatchy horror seventies horror lines. Um, I really started to try to explore stuff to kind of get caught up so that, uh, and in that process, you know, uh, uh, my first, my very first series, uh, Witch Doctor came out of that. Um, that had a really strong sort of like horror tilt to it. Uh, a lot of the illustration work I started to get, uh, had a real strong sort of design sense like that. And then, um, they really just kind of complemented each other until I kind of got up to the 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 love level that most people have been at with horror a lot longer than I have. It's it's really it's really it's really been this like sort of like growing to love it as opposed to just uh, always loving it from from the from when I was a kid and stuff like that. It was always it was always there. I always enjoyed it. Like I loved like oh you know I, yeah I'll rent Nightmare on Elm Street again. It's pretty good. And then as an adult, when I realized how much it affected the artwork I was doing, it really, uh, it really became this, this intense love for the genre. Yeah, especially Nightmare, I feel like, because, I mean, Freddy, all due respect to Michael Myers and Jason Voorhees, but the Nightmare on Elm Street films had the, the most, some of the most visual, visually imaginative set pieces out of any slasher yeah. movie in the 80s. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, even stuff like, um, you know, uh, the the old uh, uh, Universal stuff. You know, I I uh, I'd always seen those in kids as, as as a kid and really liked them and stuff. And then like when I when I actually, you know, learn more about drawing and stuff, and you'd go back and just pause it here and there and just be like, man, that is a great composition in in, in the first Frankenstein movie and stuff like that. And uh, it's like, oh man, how would I? How would I do the cross hatching on that windmill and stuff? It's it, it really it, they really play off of each other for me. Do you have a favorite Universal classic Universal monster? Mm, Creature from the Black Lagoon, hands down. Uh, same as Del Toro. <laughs> yep. Is it really? Yeah, Guillermo apparently is all about that. Oh, I didn't know that. All about the Gill Man. Yeah. Yeah, I finally actually got to see it um, in the original stereoscopic 3D uh, a couple years ago uh, when I was visiting a friend at New York Comic Con. He was just like, hey, man, it's playing around the corner. And uh, we went and saw it, and I, w- I had no idea that the original 3D was essentially the same 3D that, that Avatar uses. It's not, it's not the red-blue glasses. It's, it's the same thing. It's a, it's a way older technology than I thought it was, and it was... Just beautiful. Hear that, Jim Cameron? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he perfected it in some way, but but yeah, I was, I was amazed. It was like looking right into a diorama. Chris, what are your thoughts on the horror genre at large? Um, horror genre at large? Oh my gosh, that's like a giant general question. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm like I said. I mean, I've I've been a fan of of different genres. Horror has always been a favorite in books and comics and 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 movies. I, I think I think the the type of horror that I'm specifically more drawn to is um the the stuff that you know Christian mentioned, The Shining, and like there's something horrific about it, but there's there's also something about the the characters. And I still remember, like, in the original Alien, I was probably, like, way too young to watch it. But it's it's such a great horror movie. I still remember the scene where the one woman doesn't move. And as a young kid, way too young to watch this horribly violent movie, I was, I was like, why isn't she moving? Because, because at that point, like, you know, people always acted heroically, right? And, and people acted sensibly and i think one of the things about horror that's so interesting to me is is again the 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 people under stress and how they how they don't act sensibly and how how when when things get really terrifying 
they they do things that are that are unexpected. Uh, the Shining is is a is a classic example of like his degeneration. Um, but yeah, like horror is it's this great formula. It's this it's this acid bath for characters where you can just just peel away all the like all the facades and get down to like like all right what what really drives them when when the shit hits the fan what are they really going to do and especially if you put a couple of them in a room and all those layers get peeled away maybe maybe something else comes out and you get this this new dynamic that that you don't get in uh in peacetime you could probably say the same of of you know like really intense extreme war movies which which can be very horrific um where where characters kind of kind of go a little bit off the rails and so it's it's well it's fun to have like those those intense situations and 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 the the creatures and the monsters it's also interesting to see like well what what are these what are these people going to do in 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 the face of this and i i I think we i think we all kind of keyed in on that for for this story Oh yeah, I mean, especially you were mentioning the the claustrophobic element. Well, obviously, it's present in air, but it's it's certainly. I mean, they are in an, about to enter a literal labyrinth, right? And this it's gonna think stuff is definitely gonna go off the rails. Yeah. Oh yeah. And Chris, the metaphor of horror being a barrel of acid or an acid bath for characters is amazing, and I'm, I want it. I want a t-shirt. <laughs> that just <laughs> happened. I. Yeah. I I did not. I maybe I maybe I read it. It might be one of those it's, things that I read like five years ago. And it's a horrific metaphor about horror. It's. I mean, it, I think I think it fits. Have you guys ever read uh, *Dance Macabre* by Stephen King? No. Oh my gosh, a long time ago. Um, yeah, that, that was his analysis of. Oh god. It was his analysis. It's just on his horror. analysis of horror of the genre, right? Basically, yeah, about how yeah. he looks at it and how he writes it. Yeah. You know, strong long time. It's like uh, it's like nonfiction, like his his on writing book. Basically, yeah, yeah. yeah. Somebody wanted. Oh, to... I didn't know that. I thought it was just another another story or something. I gotta read it now. It was basically his agent was like, "You should write what you think about horror," and he's like, "Why?" And he's like, "Because you're kind of like the best selling horror writer in the world <laughs> yeah. right now." <laughs> so yeah, I love that he has enough humility to just be like, "Why?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, up in Maine. Yeah. I think that was during written during his maximum overdrive days. We're not talking like like oh, necessarily okay. peak king, but <laughs> I'm looking forward to the to the Dark Tower in August though. That should be pretty dope. Oh yeah, likewise. Yeah. I've been rereading the uh basically every single book of the Dark Tower series, but every single book with Randall Flagg too, since Randall Flagg's the big antagonist, so I'm rereading the stand right mm-hmm. now and then I'll Get into uh, I guess what would be next? Eyes of the Dragon and then Hearts in Atlantis. Yeah, yeah. So, quite the undertaking. But yeah. So, gentlemen, do you have anything uh, do, that else that you want to uh, tease or uh, or uh, push while while we got before you sign off? I'll let you guys go first. Oh, um, not really. You know, like we're we're looking forward to the release of this. Um, you know, all of us are, are are working in lots of different media right now, so uh, nothing specific to announce. But you know, hopefully, hopefully, you know, when when something something else hooks, we will uh, we will come forth. Well, you get you guys. Yeah, have everybody, the email. everybody, buy the comic book so we can make another one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Well, gentlemen, thanks again for coming on. And again, the first issue of Kill the Minotaur is out in comic book stores everywhere on Wednesday. And Comixology, if you're more digitally inclined, for whatever reason. Um, on Wednesday, June 14th. Christian, Chris, Lucas, thanks for coming on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. This was awesome. I think you know one of the, there's a couple things we should probably mention. Um, you know, first off, thank you again to Christian, Chris, and uh, and Lucas for coming on the show. That was a splendid chat. Um, but the other thing, I you know, we've lost a couple. I don't know where you guys fall on the on the Soundgarden, Audio Slave, Temple of the Dog, Chris Cornell solo career, but I think 
Cornell was probably one of my favorite front men from that era, probably second only to, to Cobain himself. Um, you know, certainly more personable than, say, Billy Corgan or Lane Staley. Um, you know, it was... Oh, I love Spoon Man. That's probably my favorite Soundgarden track. Uh, and I think we all love Casino... You know, you know my yes. name from the Casino Royale oh, yeah. soundtrack. It's still, like, in, in, in my rating of the bond themes it's still arguably one of my favorites you know like i i i, I go back and I'm not forth gonna argue you on that one yeah <laughs> in your mind yeah thanks <laughs> thank you <laughs> uh but like i go back between that and like skyfall which Ooh. you know easy uh you know uh easy, easy front runner uh and then um golden eye for the nostalgia of golden eye mm-hmm. uh not so much for the song itself because it's ridiculous golden but... <laughs> eye written by bono in the age yeah performed by tina turner that's right tina turner um but yeah so yeah y- you know my name uh definitely one of my favorite Look bond up the number. <laughs> you you know you know my name <laughs> Yeah, what do you, what are you guys stance on uh, you guys? What are you what are you guys stance on uh, Audio Slave? I loved Audio Slave. Like I I uh I kind of by just uh nature of uh of my uh friend base and my taste in music, I you know, kind of like obligatorily if that's the right word, uh obligatorious. Yeah. <laughs> Rex. <laughs> <laughs> uh liked Rage Against the Machine, but I never really got into Rage Against the Machine. But uh, I personally, the machine. <laughs> yeah, personally, personally, I think that the the the, the band members found uh, their home in my heart with Audio Slave because it was Chris Cornell and, for all intents and purposes, Rage Against the Machines mm-hmm. minus whatever that guy's Roca. yeah, the lead singer. Um, so like you know, for me. Uh, Audio Slave was like where it was at in terms of Rage Against the Machine. Honestly, the first half of that first Audio Slave album, mm-hmm. some of the best work Chris Cornell has yeah. ever done. And this may seem blasphemous in some circles. <gasps> I might prefer Audio Slave, certainly over Temple of the Dog. I don't think I've ever actually heard Temple of the Dog. Going hungry. Oh, that's hey, Temple of the Dog. That's Temple of the oh. Dog. <laughs> yeah. Definitely does sound like Chris Cornell now that you mention it. Well, it's but I had never put. <laughs> He's duetting with Eddie Vedder. Gosh, oh, well, yes. <laughs> yeah, very, uh, very grungy. Um, mm. And then all they needed was like a spin doctor. <laughs> yeah. Well, but so if I said I like that first Audio Slave album better than say any Soundgarden album, oh, okay. <sighs> I thought you were saying something else. <sighs> Be- say Rage Against Machine. Better, like, better than Audio Speedwagon. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. No, I'll take. I'll still take Rage over Audio Slave, mm-hmm. but uh, I'll take Audio Slave over Soundgarden and Temple of the Dog. I, 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 I would, I, I, I would not fault you for that. Uh, then again, the internet will. The, yeah, to the internet <laughs> at Sab Stone Show. How dare you? Yeah, I don't agree. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, I mean, but then again, I just said. Essentially, that I preferred, you know, Audio Slave over Rage Against the Machine. So, I guess pretty easy for me to be like, yeah, okay, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I enjoy Rage Against the Machine. I just never got into them, whereas yeah. I got into Audio Slave. Fair enough. I I I uh, I remember when Rock Audio was Slave oh. was like a big thing, mm-hmm. and being annoyed. Because I liked Rage Against the Machine, and I wanted Rage Against the Machine to be a band. Mm-hmm. And there were so many other things stopping that from happening. It wasn't the fact, you know, Audio Slave, of course, you know, they were having a good time doing their own thing, and I think Zach De La Roca was the main reason. Yeah. But um, yeah, as but just, if, if only one member of the band quits, yeah. it's probably that member yeah. of the band. <laughs> and so in, in my head, I was just like, oh, I just want more Rage. It's, it's like a reverse Guns N' Roses, because yeah, yeah. everyone else quit. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, I want, more, I want more Rage, man. I want more Rage. But, I mean, Cornell's voice. I mean, like, it, I, I, I wouldn't consider myself an expert in, in any of his bands, unfortunately. I remember when they had their comeback album, uh, Soundgarden. I ran away for too long, man, man, man. I bought that album. That's you, fucking cool. You know what? Uh, single... Uh, what single the uh, first uh, comeback Soundgarden song was attached to? What what film it was attached to? Yeah. The Avengers. Oh, yeah, Joss Whedon's Avengers. Yeah. 
There you have it. But yeah, I so. do remember a Soundgarden song being on there and being like, "Really?" Yeah, it plays <laughs> over the credits. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's it's fine. So yeah. I think the bigger loss, though, uh, at least for for you and me, is mm-hmm. the uh, is the loss of uh, Sir Roger Moore. Yeah. The yep, yep, yep. longest running Bond, um, the manager to the Spice Girls. Yes, yes, and the voice of the radio on in the Saint with Val Kilmer. Oh, and the, um, uh, the original Saint, the original Saint. <laughs> yes, <laughs> on television, and the sausage loving man in Boat Trip, starring Cuba oh. Gooding Jr. Wow. I thought mine was a deep cut. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even mention Cannonball Run. That's fine. That's a well loved movie. Yeah, yeah. It's people, people, <laughs> people just forget that it happened. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but when you mention it, they're like, "Oh yeah, that, that was fine." Yeah, and they like tell me the plot to Smokey and the Bandit, and I just smile and nod. It's like, "Yes, that's the movie you're thinking of." <laughs> 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 but um, they both have Burt Reynolds. It's cool. But the uh, yeah, I think in. We mention as much, and this episode won't get posted for fucking months because of how far in advance I work. But the, uh, you know, on the B- James Bond podcast, look for the <laughs> Honor Majesty Secret Service episode in, uh, in August. Um, they, uh, Roger Moore really is the the fun Bond. He isn't as self serious. He isn't as morose, and there is no really no self loathing at all. No. in his incarnation of 007, which is kind of refreshing. He's the gateway Bond, I think. You know, yeah. Well, he, I think he's the easiest. No, I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's tough because I feel like the easiest gateway nowadays is Craig. Because like, if you show like a little kid, like octopusy, yeah, or living like say live and let <laughs> die, they're gonna be like, what? Um, <laughs> here, let's watch Moonraker. Yeah, <laughs> you like space, right, Chuck? Yeah, and uh, in. <laughs> But I mean, I I, I know what you, I know what you're saying with that. Like, yeah. I think because he is not this brash, blunt object, so to speak, Bond. You know, he's not anti-authority. He's not mean. He's not pissy. And he was the white tux jacket, right? He certainly, you know, wore it quite a few times. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where's yeah. it? In like uh, Octopussy. Yeah. Just, I'm just, Reference nothing but octopus. It's my mm. mom's favorite Bond movie. Really? Yeah. Awkward. And her favorite Bond is Roger Moore, of course. But um, well, my mother's favorite uh, Roger or James Bond film and Roger Moore film, I suppose by extension, was uh, For Your Eyes Only. That's yeah. a good one. Yeah. But I mean, you know, he's got great title tracks, which I know has nothing to do with him. But he's he's fun, and I, I mentioned this on the James Bond podcast as well. Like, he's the Bond I'd put on as like comfort Bond in the background when I'm doing work or something, and it's not because I was. Not interested. It's just it was nice to have on, because it wasn't this super serious, intense. Holy shit! It's the end of the world. I mean, sometimes it was close to being the end of the world because he's trying to stop it. But you know, violent over the top, and there's a place for that. And I love that. You know, I I, I prefer my Bond to be Timothy Dalton. Um, hmm. But you'll catch some flack for that. Yeah, it's it's a huge. Uh, I remember they once asked Roger Moore if he ever watched any of the D- Timothy Dalton Bond movies. And he said, Timothy Dalton's a good friend of mine, and I am a very honest man, so I chose not to, because if I didn't like him, I, I couldn't lie. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know if he ever... This, that was in a uh, James Bond encyclopedia book I had where the most recent Bond movie filming was GoldenEye. So that was a long time ago. Who knows mm-hmm. if he ever saw him. But uh, as of... Because he wrote a reflective piece um, of 50 Years of Bond during Skyfall. Oh, he mentions that... He still, as of, what, five years ago, he still hadn't seen any of the Timothy Dalton films. Yeah, and I think, you know, again, that he said he, he's he's doing that, to, you know, because he considers Dalton a friend and he doesn't want to... I think that ignorance is bliss kind of thing, you know, um, because it is a very different bond. Um, but it's... At that point, he was coming off, like, 12 years of being James Bond. Yeah. He's like, I'm good. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it really... Like, I was pretty devastated because you know bond is like my favorite franchise of movies and you know they they're all, they were all still around until you know a couple of days ago and you know it's this like you know 50 plus year film franchise and it's just it's it's a bummer man because he was such a nice sweet guy by all accounts and uh you know it's a shame you know and my favorite 
of his is Spy Who Loved Me, and and I need to I need to throw that on sometime soon and just watch it again because that I remember the first time I watched that movie, it was one of those experiences where I finished and I was like, what a fun fucking time, like holy shit, that was so much fun, and I it wasn't the first the first Roger Moore movie I ever saw was Live and Let Die because Beale fanatic I wanted to you know oh it's the Paul McCartney movie <laughs> even though he just sings a the theme song but um. Apparently he does really well in the new Pirates of the Caribbean film. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nah. Um That's the only film my father wants to see this year. Yeah, I I uh not uh I I, st- I stopped at 2. And uh Stop two. Stop two. Yeah. I think I made it to 3. Uh interesting, interesting. <laughs> um so anyway, you know, I I you know, I, I I guess it was probably like the. Th- it probably was the third Roger Moore movie I saw. I think I'd probably seen uh, um, Octopussy before that or something. So all over the place. But yeah, Spy Love. I remember finishing it, being like, "What a fucking fun movie, man!" And and that is my favorite Bond theme of all time. Nobody does it better. It's so damn good. So damn good. The way that you hold me. I always like the way that they throw the title in there too. Yeah. Clever fucking bastards. Yeah. It's better than like heaven above me. The, the spy, spy who loved, loved me, keeping all my secrets safe tonight. You got Def- you got definitely snuck isms? it in better than <laughs> yeah, than a few to a kill. A few to a kill. It still doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah, at least they never slipped an octopusy into the fire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which should have been the title of that track. I think it's the per- the parenthetical on I the single version. I think it is, version. yeah. 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 Uh, unfortunately, uh, Roger Moore is the, uh, oddly enough, even though he was Bond the most, uh, the Bond that I'm least familiar with. I have a feeling you'd probably like Roger Moore Bond. It, I might. It's just the, the ones that I've been exposed to. Um, well, I guess you've watched I've watched. Us. I've watched almost all of them. Yeah. A View to Oddly Enough, A View to a Kill is one of the few I think one of two Bond movies I haven't seen. Um I'm and, gonna, I'm going to call it now. And yet it's one that I'm really I want to see. I'm going to I'm going to call it now. That's going to be your favorite Bond movie. <laughs> from what I've heard from from listening to uh James Bonding, yeah. it sounds like it's right up my alley just being like awful but fun. Uh I mean Butterfly Lady that that oh, that Jesus. that that sold it for me and apparently that happens within the first like five minutes oh my god but yeah. like the james bonding guys spent over a half an hour yeah that was that made. was the how did this get made episode mm-hmm. uh, they spent like 45 minutes talking about they, it they did and i was like <laughs> i love you guys but and i was like i was like how have i still not seen this one i need to i need to like borrow it from sam because i know he has all of them on blu-ray oh. yeah oh. Of them, yes, but um, but no, it, it, I mean Roger Moore, Spice World, yeah, he 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 was not just James Bond, so uh, uh, yeah, down there, yeah, Some the the enemy. VHS box is, is for whatever reason yeah. just chilling. Is there. it Meatloaf in that too? Yes, he is. He's the bus driver. <laughs> he mel <laughs> he milks cows as yeah. Sam was pantomiming. Yeah. <laughs> Might as well. <laughs> and ever I mean, see he'd m- do anything for love. But he won't do that. Uh, ever see uh, The 51st State with uh, Samuel Jackson, Robert Carlyle, and Emily Mortimer? No. Okay. <laughs> Meatloaf's in that, and at the very end, he explodes. Ooh. Not like he's in an explosion. As in, like, he, like, puffs up. Like, like Big Trouble in Little China style? Kinda, except he isn't, like... Thunder? <laughs> yeah, he isn't incredibly frustrated. Well, he might be frustrated, but that's not the, the cause of his... Of his uh, combustion. Um, yeah. So thanks for the memory, Sir Roger. And, you know, for all your work with UNICEF, you know. So, which is what got him knighted. It wasn't his acting. It was it was his work, his charity work. So, and he, the dude was, I mean, Homeboy would have been 90 if he, mm. if this year or so. <laughs> homeboy. Yeah. <laughs> he Sir was a Homeboy he, to me. Yeah, yeah. He, I dare you. He, 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 he was the oldest Bond. Yes. Yeah, born the same year as my grandfather. Oh, which is weird. Um, yeah, but no, thank thanks again, you know, Sir Roger. I I did, you know, call my father as soon as I found out, and he already knew. 
Dads always know because my dad told me. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I I sent the message on our little group chat and Sam was like, oh, yeah. yeah. I know. Yeah. I, and I called my father and the first thing he says is just live and let die. And I was just like, yeah, dad, <laughs> live and let die. Literally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I call him just octopusy, just yeah, dad, <laughs> octopusy, <laughs> <laughs> Moonraker, click. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just that's what my conversations with my father have, have devolved into <laughs> movie titles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Crocodile Dundee two. Yeah, yes, father. <laughs> to live and die in the West. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fear and loathing in Las Vegas. I'm in Wichita right now, but yes. Yeah. Don't be a menace to South Central while drinking your juice in the hood. I'm surprised you caught that one, but yes, absolutely. <laughs> you know that one exists? Oh, that's impressive. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> but, Which, uh, uh, whatever the subtitle is to this year's Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> um, Dead what? Men Tell No Tales. Yeah. Dead Men Tell No is. Tales. Yeah. Yeah. Featuring, Sparrow. featuring yeah. the bad guy from Skyfall. Yeah, Javier yeah. Bardem. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't I don't know why I keep forgetting his name, but he's he's literally the only reason why I'm thinking about going to see the movie because I love Javier Bardem so much. Yeah. No Country for Old Men. Fantastic. Yeah. Skyfall. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Vicky I think Christina he's in Barcelona. Yeah. I haven't seen it, but I know he's in it. Uh, <laughs> but he's he's one of the reasons why I loved Skyfall so much. Yes. Yes. But yeah, thanks. Thanks again. So, Roger, I did watch uh, Free Your Eyes Only when I got home yesterday. I was just like, I need this. I need this. Um, and it was good. It's my favorite Bond film as well. Uh, it's my favorite Roger Moore Bond oh! film. Oh! Straight out of Compton! Compton, Compton. Almost Compton. slipped up. Almost fucked up cocky there. Cocky little, cocky little, cocky little freak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Favorite Bond film is, coincidentally, the episode we record tonight, which you'll see in three months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you... Jake, you started watching Riverdale, correct? <gasps> Welcome oh, to the fold, Jake yeah. Boo. Yeah. Yeah. Who killed Jason? Blossom. I don't know. I do. Um, <laughs> it's it's super fun. I, I, I equated it to kind of like how I felt when I watched the first season or first two seasons of the OC. It's just like, it's just fun, campy fun. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying it like in a degrading, I mean like, oh, it's only this. But I enjoy like the, the core cast. Solid. Solid. Um, Betty is teary eyed a lot. Mm-hmm. Like, man, she is like got to be. Like, she is emotional, dehydrated, and exhausted. <laughs> She's crying a lot on that show. Yeah. Um, Jughead is exactly what I wanted because uh, you know Jughead was my favorite way back when we reviewed the uh, Mark yeah. Wade, uh, Archie stuff. I really there's uh, really there's something Jughead. that happens because uh, you're only about a handful like of five episodes. or six episodes yeah. in. There's I there's think? some there's something that happens in a couple. Ep- I forget exactly when it happens, but it happens in a couple episodes uh, that you being. The the fan of Jughead that you are, mm-hmm. I I want to ask you about, but I don't want to I don't want to spoil. Anything. I will say two things that have nothing to do with the plot. It's yeah. not a spoiler. That are in Archie's room. One, he has a Dog Day Afternoon poster, mm-hmm. which is fucking awesome. Two, he has a Batman Rebirth poster. Yeah, fucking like topical. Yeah, <laughs> topical, 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 yeah. topical, topical little freak. You fucking shot me. You fucking <laughs> shot me, man. Uh, uh, you fucking uh, shot. Me. Um, yeah. Um, it, but no, it's it's super it's super fun. Um, Luke Perry is his dad, which I thought was perfect. Right casting. on, yeah, right on, man. His, his uh, later in the series, I don't know if you know this, but uh, his mom makes an appearance, oh, really? and I don't, I don't appreciate. Oh man, I kind of like just the yeah Archie and his dad. Yeah, no, well, like I, I, I don't want to spoil like what goes on in that series, but like what they, goes on, they don't they don't pull a How I Met Your Mother and wait. Eight seasons or however many it was to reveal 74. who the mother was. Yeah. Uh, they, they they about halfway eh, t- two thirds of the way through the season, uh, his his mom makes an appearance, and I I personally don't really uh, like her. I'll probably finish. I mean, I'm, I plan on just binging the rest, the yeah. rest of it my next day off. Uh, so. I I will say my friend uh, Megan, who uh, was waiting for it to come on Netflix because. She doesn't have cable, and the CW app doesn't work right for her for some reason. Uh, she binged the... I think she was like five episodes behind when the CW app crapped out. Uh, she binged it, and she is a huge Archie fan. Uh, like, s- she and Sam could have discussions. Uh, God help me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but she... So she she watched it, and... Um, 
uh, was was the last episode when I was excited about Sabrina being in it or complaining yeah. that Sabrina wasn't in it? You were complaining that she wasn't. Oh, okay, her. so oh. my friend Megan watching it, and she was like, I mean, you know, this guy's holding a comic book that Sabrina's in, and it's not even like a Sabrina the Teenage Witch comic. It's like some like comic that she just appears in. Mm. Uh, so like you'd have to be like a super fan to know that Sabrina's in that. And then like... There were like things here and there, you know, like lines that like reference, you know, Sabrina that I wouldn't pick up on because I don't the the most I know about Sabrina, the teenage witch, is that uh, Melissa Joan Hart played her in a live action show. I just hope that if she shows up in season two, she just plays her again and pretends to be like a high schooler. I, it was so <laughs> I want I want yeah. Melissa Joan Hart to be Sabrina. Yeah. I'd take it. I'm sure they'll yeah. reach out for something. Wouldn't you know, it, they love wouldn't that it, legacy? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it, well, I mean, nice. I mean, with with some of the cast. I mean, Skeet Ulrich. Have, have you got? Oh, yeah. yeah, oh Skeet yeah. Ulrich plays Jughead's dad. Yeah. Um, uh, a couple other. Uh, I knew that going into it, because um, I had just saw like the casting. Yeah, and I kind of wish I didn't because their moment is nice. Yeah, their little like, I, their talk. I I didn't. I had no idea, uh-huh. and also like I spent like the first half of that episode going why do i know that actor yeah who the hell is that like because i looks like johnny depp yeah. but it's not johnny he, depp. he looks like the bad guy from the first screen yeah. move oh it is yeah. <laughs> matthew lillard yeah <laughs> who's in the first episode of twin peaks oh. yeah which if you're done i'm done. talking about riverdale I'm done uh i uh, the the f- fir- first episode of twin peaks came out or i guess the first two because it's a a, a dose parter um but uh, uh, but yeah. So, uh, and by the time this episode drops, parts three and four will have come out because I think they're going to do two, two episodes a night or a week, I guess. In you know, uh, but uh, I don't know how I feel about it. It's like ramped up the weird a lot, mm. uh, and ramped down the story mm. a bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then again, it's also still just the first essentially the first episode it's it, it's it's setting up a new universe that kind of exists within you know the, the 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 original twin peaks universe but it's an expanded universe because i feel like it spent more time in new york city than twin peaks huh. um yeah uh uh for those of you that are caught up on uh, the 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 first two seasons of Twin Peaks, uh, we Black Lodge. Yeah, we last left Dale Cooper uh, stuck in the Black Lodge, actually, uh, and uh, Bob had taken over his body. Uh, the first thing we see in the new Twin Peaks is Dale Cooper still in the Black Lodge talking to the giant, um, and we find out that Dale Cooper, Bob Dale Cooper, Bob Cooper, who cares. Uh, no one's listening. Dale uh, Cooper. yeah. Uh, Dale Cooper has been. <laughs> yeah. No one's listening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wait, Christian and Chris and uh, and Lucas aren't on the show anymore. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Click next episode. Uh, uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, he's been done for twenty minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, but yeah. So um, uh, the Bob Cooper has been going around for. The 25 years now um kind of just doing whatever he wants he's no longer an fbi agent he's got a little like horde of devil's rejects type people uh going around and like presumably he's actually become like a serial killer essentially uh i i i can only imagine using some of the knowledge that he gained from you know taking over dale cooper's body on how to effectively evade uh capture because dale cooper was a pretty good fbi agent uh one thing i don't definitely do not like you know put it down in the in the dislike column uh it doesn't seem to be as silly and lighthearted. uh so david lynch comes back sad and angry yeah oh but you know what he takes advantage of the fact that it's on showtime you get to see some butts and some today, uh, <laughs> and like fucking any penis, not yet. Mm. Uh, this isn't HBO, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, 
you know, Game of Thrones has oh, has peen. You don't have to explain the preponderance <laughs> of penis on the home box office channel. <laughs> uh, but uh, but uh, uh, there's also like a brutal fucking death scene mm-hmm. in it too, uh, and, and and ghosts apparently, which I mean it clearly the original series not um, above ghosts because you know Bob. Uh, the one armed man makes an appearance too, which that's fun. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I don't even have to make the sound half yeah. the time anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a discount Elijah Wood. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Uh, he's too busy with Dirk Gently these yeah. days. Which I am still looking forward to season two. Yeah, yeah, that's filming. Or I guess right series now. two because it's on the BBC America. Yeah, they're they're filming in Vancouver right now. Oh, so. That's, that's I enjoyed it. It was fun. It was a fun one. As I am wont to say. Yes. Yes. I went to Charlotte over the weekend. Oh. Yeah, it was the first trip I didn't have like a con to work or like a wedding to go to since like I was in Tampa about a yeah. year and a half ago. And uh, close to two years ago now. And uh, no, I just got to hang out. I played some uh, ski ball. I played some Tron. Oh. Um, How was the Norkalakiaki? North Kakalaka is always... Is that what it's... <laughs> I've heard it both ways. Ooh. I just okay, Sean Spencer. Or not Sean Spencer. <laughs> John Syke. Uh, yeah, the... Uh, uh, it was fine. <laughs> the, yeah, no, it was... I got my Carolina barbecue. I got all that... Nice. All that goodness, you know. Everywhere I go, fucking Tron. 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 There's Tron right here. In, in in the DVD rack and in the laser disc rack. So every week, yeah, I'm guaranteed a Tron encounter. You are. If you want, I can set it up like the Superman poster, so that it's always looking at you. Oh, I'm, I'll know. <laughs> I'll know. Um, there are at least two copies of Tron in this house. I also, yeah, yeah. As I sense it, I, uh, you know, I got a, I got to play. A pe- I sell them, and you come in, and you're like, this house is clear. <laughs> yeah, something is not right. Um. No, you know, I got to play uh, the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers game, the movie, for the uh, Super Nintendo. That's nice. Sweet. Nice. Um, and uh, the Shadow, which mm-hmm. apparently has a pinball mm-hmm. cabinet. I, you, you sent that picture, and I, I think I was at work, so I only had a chance to glance at it. And then by the time I was done, it, 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 the moment had passed. But I've actually played that pinball game before. So when you sent it, I was like, oh! <laughs> <laughs> Sam noise. <laughs> yeah, very, very me noise. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it was just a lot of fun. I, I, I like hanging out in North Carolina. They, their uh, comic book convention is the same weekend as Awesome Con. Oh. So, the same weekend as my friend Nicole's wedding. Yeah. So, you won't be able to make either. Nope. Just the wedding. Yeah. You know, Ilya was the first person we ever had on the guest we ever had on the show. Yeah. Way back when. Yeah, 152 weeks ago. Well, his episode is like episode 15. <laughs> so like 140, 37 weeks ago. But still. But yeah, you guys get anything else? Watch no films, tell no lies. Did you, anybody here see Alien Covenant? Actually, I did. I was I was tra- I was like I've done something. I I I have done something. I I saw the Alien Covenant. Uh and it is a very slow burn of a movie i'm not complaining when i say it's a slow burn but i'm like throwing out a a warning because like i can uh, while i was sitting there watching it i was like i can totally see people being very disinterested in how slowly this movie's working because like the first alien movie when i was when i was uh younger and i watched it for the first time i was like screw this this is slow it's boring it's not aliens which you know is exciting and guns and stuff. Uh, this is slower than that, um, but in my opinion, totes worth it. Uh, and like uh, Ridley Scott brings back like the kind of like really like kind of scary thriller aspect of the first Alien movie. But it does take about halfway through the movie for it to kind of like kick in. But like, oh man, uh, uh, oh man, shit. <laughs> but like, yeah, no, I fucks with it. I fucks with it, yo. Uh, one thing that going into it, I was like, I wonder how they're going to address Prometheus, or if this is going to be like a Superman Returns thing where they're like, eh, Prometheus, maybe, you know. Uh, but like, straight up, 
yes, it's a it's a sequel to Prometheus. Uh, it has um, uh, Fassbender, David. yeah, playing two characters oh. because he play he 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 brings back David, mm-hmm. uh, full bodied David. Uh, he's no longer just a head because apparently, uh, what's her name, Emily uh, Elizabeth Shaw, yeah, uh, was able to fix him. Uh, and then he uh, he plays oh, what the hell is his his other robot's name? Because he has a different name. It starts with an H. Uh, Herbert. Yeah, sure, Herbert. We'll say Herbert. Um, I, for, I felt terrible the in, while watching the movie. I couldn't remember his name. Um, but uh, they have and and they play very well off of each other, and it's very very cool to see some of the 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 camera trickery i mean i know it's all cgi but like i'm gonna call it the camera trickery because it looked neat uh with them like sharing scenes and interacting with each other uh david teaches herbert how to play the recorder because herbert or one of the things that they learned from david is that he has too much free will so they backed that down uh so he's uh, no longer uh, uh, Herbert is not able to create uh, and 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 be artsy and stuff like that. So like, there's this cute little scene that I needed to know. Yeah, it's Walter. Walter, not even an the, H. The <laughs> other Fassbender <laughs> character is Walter. Yeah, that's why you can remember it. Yeah. <laughs> someone, someone listening is like, it's fucking Walter. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Uh, I, know. I, I w- had I not been talking, I would have been looking it up as well. Um, but yeah, so he teaches Walter how to play, and it's like a very, it's a very cute scene. Goes on way longer than it needs to, but at the same time, like one thing that I think this movie does really well and really shows off how well it does it is character building, uh, because uh, like everyone has that like scene that goes on a little bit too long to explain who they are and you know and and whatnot um but yeah uh not what i would say a fun movie uh but a very a uh, very entertaining movie uh and uh, but yeah it, it, don't worry it is not without its chest bursters oh. uh uh although in this one it, uh so uh with without uh well eh, whatever we'll, we'll i'm talking about it you're going to hear some some spoilers depending on your tolerance level. I know my tolerance level is very low for spoilers, so I'm going to be saying things that I wouldn't want to hear before going into a movie. But uh, one of the things that they do kind of clarify is, uh, or one of the things that they tried to like kind of like bridge the gap with, um, and like errors that they fixed with Prometheus is like why the chestburster, quote unquote, in Prometheus isn't a fucking chestburster. And David explains it as um, the engineers, although he doesn't call them engineers, but whatever. Uh, the engineers had this virus. And I've been spending these past X number of years, I think it's 10 years, that uh, he's on this planet by himself because um, Emily, Elizabeth Shaw, Elizabeth Shaw, Shaw uh, dies because I guess she didn't want to come back for the second movie. So they killed her character off in between movies. Um uh, but uh, uh, she, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, David's like, oh, the, you know, they they had, uh, they had created this virus, but I've been tinkering away for the past 10 years to perfect it and blah, blah, blah. And uh, then you see like a legit face hugger, like come out of an egg and all of the, you know, all the things that the nerd boys wanted from uh from the, the 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 Prometheus and all the things that pissed them off that they didn't get in Prometheus. Yeah, I mean, um, they did say it was supposed to be an alien movie, though. <laughs> <laughs> until what's his name took over writing and said no it's not an alien movie yeah. no, damon lindelof yeah fuck that guy um lindelof. yeah yeah more like lindel a little bit off of this dick <laughs> <laughs> got him <laughs> got him uh but uh but yeah <laughs> that's that's hardly the biggest stretch we've ever had on the oh, show I know, right I know. uh i make them all the fucking time yeah uh, <laughs> I, 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 remember, I do worse. <laughs> I remember hearing preponderance of penis uh, a little earlier, <laughs> which is fantastic. How do we do as well as we do? Uh, well, do we, like, because, because we people, do because well? people don't hear these parts. <laughs> That's, yeah. people, do don't we, he, people don't hear this half. How have we last 152 uh, weeks? I, well, you know, that's the question. How have we not killed each other yet? The 150 things is quite easy. 
we just keep doing it. No <laughs> one true. is stopping us. No one's forcing us. No one's us putting to do up a show. fight. Um, <laughs> no one's forcing that, you to do anything, Jake. The fact that there's more than but a download from each of us. Your dad and my mom. Well, I, so I, five I, downloads. Yeah, and I was doing the math. We do. Well, I'll save it for off, off mic. We yeah. do. Very, we do well. We do Hand well. Hand over fist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because it's weird. I'll talk yeah. about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Because they don't need to know. Yeah. Just um, know that it's pretty good. <laughs> it's good. Pretty good. We're like a garage band that somehow keep, people keep coming back to see. Yeah. <laughs> We're like a a halfway decent garage band. Yeah. Like we get. We get we we open for good bands. We do, we do. <laughs> I called a, somebody was talking to me about it earlier on the show, like a publicist, and I was just like, "Look, we're like the most freewheeling, devil may care podcast in the comic book industry. It doesn't mean we're the best. It doesn't mean we're the most popular. But do we like ride just like by the seat of our fucking pants every week? It's yeah. literally my motto for this show." <laughs> Except for my Friday the Thirteenth, uh, not a uh, uh, side side quest. That one I do research. For. I love that your hand is in forever. The I love you, Gene right? Simmons thing. <laughs> I yeah. For those of you that can't see, which is Everyone. all of you, uh, Zach, uh, I I banged my hand up pretty damn good at work today. And then he got. Then he heard it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> got him. Uh, got me. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, so uh, I actually had to go to uh, an urgent care and get um, bandaged up and uh, Doc decided to to put, not in a cast, but just like a a wrap to keep me um, uh, in in one position. And it's essentially, yeah, it's it's more the hang loose. Yeah, it's true. Because my my pointer finger's not stuck. Yeah, my index, middle, and ring finger are loosey-goosey, but I like to point... (laughs) <laughs> and so, therefore, I'm always doing the... the You're the, also Doctor Strange. Yeah. Because oh. um, <laughs> that's the noise that Doctor yeah. Strange makes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, um, but yeah. So, Alien Covenant was good. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll see it eventually. You get, you get backbursters. Uh, oh, is that what that thing is? Yeah. Well, so, you get you get chestbursters and backbursters in, 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 yeah, pick in the Pick a side, Jesus. Right. Well, so so the, the backburster, you, uh, you know in the in the trailer when you see the guy step on the thing and you yeah. know, like the spore and the things come out? Um, so that's the like the last remnants of uh, what was the virus that the engineers had made. Okay. And it gets uh, absorbed through the skin uh, by someone in a very local... Uh, proximity to the the exposed spore. Mm-hmm. Are those uh, spores everywhere, or that no. just like he happened to be the most he, unlucky he, bastard? Yeah, no, he just happened to be the most unlucky. Ba- two people in the movie actually, but you only see it in, to one in the trailer. Um, the guy who I, while in the movie, thought was dude from Burn Notice, turns out it is not dude from Burn Notice. Um, You're all over the place in this movie. Is it, is it Herbert? <laughs> is it Halascophus? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Halascophus. Um, <laughs> his name's Halascophus. Halito- Halitosis. Halitosis. <laughs> oh, gross. Walter. Um, but yeah, so that gestates. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> Whoa, gross. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that thing gestates inside you and then bursts out your back. But it does look like the typical xenomorph that we know and love, but in like baby form. Protomorph. Yeah. Actually, yeah, that is the uh, the 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 quote-unquote term oh for it uh because uh there there's there's a guy credited in the credits for proto slash uh, protomorph slash xenomorph uh which again not the name of the alien how's uh, danny mcbride he's actually pretty good in it i uh, i was i was impressed i was impressed with his ability to not be just a silly character because he is he is by no means the comic relief of the movie that's billy crudup the guy that gets face hugged. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Actually. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> he, he 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 is kind of the Take the Doctor Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's why I recognized him. Yeah. Penis. <laughs> In the wind. 
a little electric blueberry penis. Yeah. <laughs> electric <laughs> blueberry penis. Was it? Is that? Is that one of our albums? <laughs> electric. Uh, the episode is actually electronic blueberry. It's fuck you. <laughs> oh, episode. Oh yeah, no. Right, right, right. Electric, <laughs> electric blueberry penis is my favorite. Uh, why did Alexa <laughs> answer to that? Oh. Electric blueberry Cannot penis. Cannot find is my, electric blueberry penis. Is my favorite. Alexa, stop. <laughs> Electric blueberry penis is my favorite uh, Mountain Dew flavor. Yeah, <laughs> ride the lightning. <laughs> <laughs> do the do. Oh, oh. shit! Uh, Have a coke. We're, yeah. What? If I could give the world a coke, um, <laughs> fuck, we're just descending into madness. Anything to add before we sign off, boys? No, no, stop listening. Who the fuck listens to this? Pause this podcast. <laughs> Watch the trailer for Mad Max Fury Road. It's the third episode. <laughs> Pause that's the third, that's, that's how the third long episode. we've been doing the show. Like I said. Mad Jerry Max. the King Lawler was still in WWE. Larry King Live was still alive, and uh, still no, I know the show. <laughs> one day, <laughs> one the prophecy will be true. One day, um, <laughs> Jay Leno and David Letterman, I can think of their names, were both still on the air when we started the show. Yeah, that's the wild, yeah. wild thing. I love you, Larry King. Yeah, <laughs> good Marlon Brando interview from a way long, long time ago. Yeah, he thought uh, Ringo Starr was George Harrison once. Yeah, he also uh, asked Olivia Harrison what it was like to have the song Something written about her. Due diligence on the king. Hail to the king. But hail to Christian Canamesa, Chris Pacetto, and Lucas Kettner's Kill the Minotaur out in comic book stores everywhere on Wednesday, June 14th, and on Comixology if you're digitally inclined. Thanks again, gentlemen, for coming on the show. Chris, do you have anything you'd like to add? <laughs> Nah, I'm good. <laughs> Jake? No, sir. Fair enough. Well, this has been another installment of Catching Up. I'm Sam. I'm Chris. I'm Jake. Thank you very much. Good night, Eric. Bye. Fried chicken. This has been another Geek Out production. If you enjoyed what you heard, hey, you know, we've got a special episode every Friday. Of course, there's the usual Catching Up show every Wednesday. And you get book club episodes just about every Tuesday these days. Thanks for listening.